Hello, I'm Brooke Atkins and welcome to the Heart Foundation and Royal College of General Practitioners webinar on the diagnosis and management of heart failure. I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land on which we are meeting today. I would also like to pay respect to elders past, present and emerging. So for the next 45 minutes, we will be focusing on the diagnosis and management of heart failure. We will be referring to the National Heart Foundation of Australia and Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand Australian Clinical Guidelines for the Prevention, Detection and Management of Heart Failure. We have a great lineup of speakers who will discuss key practice points and common clinical challenges arising in the management of heart failure patients in general practice. So without further ado, please let me introduce Dr. Atefa Sham, the Chair of the RACGP Cardiology Specific Interest Group, who will introduce our presenter and will describe how the session will run. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, I would like to thank again uh, the National Health Foundation and staff behind the scene for the great work over the last few weeks, uh, hand in hand with the uh, RSCGP specific interest. Uh, this webinar is our third one, and hopefully uh, we will have more collaborative work in the future. Uh, for, those who, uh, for, for those who are not aware, uh, the RSCGP specific interest uh, cardiology is a growing group, almost uh, 1,500 GPs so far. Uh, with a specific interest in cardiology, including uh, GP trainees and uh, um, trainees, registrar and fellows. Uh, it's uh, actually, it's, uh, it is established uh, mid-2017 uh, and we welcome more GPs we have, uh, who have uh, specific uh, skills or interest in cardiology to join us. Uh, as you know, this year of uh, the GP20 conference, um, as you can see, it is completely virtual thanks uh, to COVID-19 and uh, which presented uh, with a lot of uh, challenges. Uh, today, as uh, you've heard from Brooke, uh, uh, for the next half an hour, uh, we will be talking about heart failure and how it is relevant to general practice, then we'll conclude with uh, a Q&A. Uh, it's important to know heart failure causes a significant burden for the patients and healthcare system in developed countries. Um, actually, approximately uh, 50 to 75 percent of patients with heart failure die within five years of diagnosis. Um, evidence shows um, heart failure accounts for one to three um, percent of overall healthcare spending, mainly due to uh, repeated hospital admissions and prolonged inpatient length of stay. Uh, in developed countries, re prevalence of heart failure ranges from 1 to 3%, rising to 10% or more in those aged 75 years of, or older. Um, well, uh, that's why we're getting uh, a presentation today for the heart failure, how that's important and relevant to our general practice. Uh, by, this end of, uh, by, uh, the, by the end of this pre uh, presentation, we would hope our listeners to understand um, uh, the main recommendation of uh, National Heart Foundation and Cardiac uh, Society Australia and New Zealand to, to 2018 Australian guidelines for prevention and detection management of heart failure relevant, relevant to general practice, uh, as well describe evidence-based uh, recommendation for the diagnosis and classifications of heart failure patients, explain uh, the pharmacological management of patients with heart failure, with HIF-REF and hif -PIF, uh, including up to treatment to achieve target doses, summarize uh, non-pharmacological management of chronic heart failure and relevant comorbidities. Uh, we actually are lucky to have speaking to us today, Associate Professor uh, Rolf Odom. Um, uh, let me introduce Rolf. It's, uh, he's a, a GP in Carlton in Victoria, and he's an honorary clinical Associate Professor uh, at the Department of General Practice, University of Melbourne. Uh, he has had long-standing interest in the management of chronic uh, conditions in general practice, especially diabetes, heart disease. He teaches as well uh, medical students, uh, GP registrar and general practitioners. So please join me, join me in welcoming Professor uh, Rolf Adam uh, and over to you, Rolf. Thank you, Dr. Atef, uh, for the introduction. As you heard my name, Associate Professor Ralph Autumn, I'm going to talk today a little bit about the uh, development of the heart failure management guidelines. Um, now, uh, these are my disclosures. Um, now, the 
heart failure guidelines, the slide deck I have is actually quite a comprehensive slide deck. So I'm going to go through it uh, fairly fast, but I'll try and highlight the parts that I think are directly relevant to general practice. So these were the guidelines that were released in 2018, and I was on uh, the committee that actually went through and developed them. So, I mean, the first thing, um, we're all aware of what heart failure is. It is a complex, but it is a clinical syndrome. It is something that we diagnose clinically, and then we sort of sort out what the etiology is, you know, what type of heart failure and really what needs to be treated with it. So these are the classic signs and, and, and symptoms. I'm not going to go through them all, but it's interesting when I look at what really uh, tells me a lot about a patient and heart failure, orthopnea would be uh, one of the, the, the symptoms that I look for. And then of course, we all look for the JVP if we can see it, you know, the um, you know, peripheral edema and so on. But there's a range of way people present and having a high index of suspicion is really important. But this is the crux of it. So really, when we talk about heart, heart failure, we talk about two distinct varieties. There is heart failure reduced ejection fraction. So this is in people who have the signs and symptoms of heart failure, and they have uh, an ejection fraction less than 50% on an echo. And that's a really important group because most of the evidence around improvement of outcomes comes from uh, work with the heart failure reduced ejection fraction. And you know, for those who may not have caught up with the reduced ejection fraction was the old systolic heart failure and the HEFPEF or the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction was, you know, what we used to call diastolic heart failure. Yes, I'm, my grey beard is showing up a little bit. But HEFPEF is a little bit more involved in making a diagnosis. So you still have to have the symptoms and signs of heart failure. But when you do the echo, the ejection fraction is greater than 50%. But, you know, because that's within the normal range, you then have to have other evidence um, of some sort of structural abnormality, whether that be left ventricular hypertrophy, left atrial enlargement, or even, you know, which is a bit hard for echo, uh, echocardiographers, but actually assessing a diastolic dysfunction. So now don't panic about the, um, the percentages within the pie charts, they're not right. So you can see HEFREF less than 50, HEFPEF greater than 50%. So the HEFREF, you know, a, a, a very dilated, you know, baggy sort of heart. The HEFPEF, a very thickened, hardened sort of type heart. So when it comes to making a diagnosis, um, you know, you've heard me say that it was a clinical diagnosis but there are things that can certainly help us if we're not so sure. And, you know, BNP or NT pro BNP, um, it's a very good way of either ruling out or ruling in heart failure. And as you heard me say before, the echo is really important in terms of confirming our diagnosis, as well as then working out what sort of heart failure. And so this is the diagnostic algorithm. You can see coming down this pathway, you know, we've got someone who we think has got heart failure. You know, we're pretty sure on a clinical examination, we do the echo and then we can work out whether it's REF, PEF or something else that's going on. Certainly there are, in general practice, it's probably a lot of our work, the diagnosis may not be so straightforward. In which case, sometimes doing the echo will give us some information. If an echo um, is not freely available, is available, you know, thinking of our rural colleagues, you can think of doing a BNP or an NT pro BNP. Now, you know, again, um, it's not Medicare rebated, it costs around about 80 to $100, but it can be incredibly useful when it comes to, you know, working out whether someone has heart failure or not. And of course, if your BNP or pro NT pre, pro BNP is normal, you would be thinking of alternative causes. So, um, just to, to reiterate, most the most important investigation is the echo to work out what sort of heart failure they have. Sometimes uh, the the BNP or the pro BNP can be useful if we're not one hundred percent sure, and then. 
un working out what the underlying cause, because remember, heart failure is a clinical syndrome. It's not actually a diagnosis in its own right. We do need to think about what the underlying cause of that heart failure is. Now, um, just saying that, you know, there are a, a range um, of things that can actually cause a raised BNP. And so they're all listed there. But for most of the time, for us in general practice, um, you know, it will, it, it is a, a useful test. A lot of those other things we're not going to see sort of, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis. So management. So, and this is where I really want to get down to because this is important. And it is something that when we look at um, in management of heart failure, whether it be heart in the hospitals or in the community, um, it is not done very well. And the acute failure, I mean, I think it's easy. I mean, it's easy certainly for me working in a metro area, anyone with acute heart failure, I can pass on to a hospital and it gets sorted out very well. A little bit more difficult for our rural colleagues that may be hours away from, um, you know, centres, in which case, you know, having to manage that. But really that's, um, they've got their own protocols and I'm not going to go into that because where I really want to concentrate on where we can really save lots of lives is really that long-term management of heart failure. And we know that certainly for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, what we can do can have a huge impact on mortality as well as morbidity. And, you know, the mortality from HEFREF is worse than most cancers. So it's an important thing that we need to do. And this is the algorithm. Um, this is uh, what we put together. And you can see there, there are two pathways. Now, most commonly people will present congested, in which case we would start with an ACE inhibitor or if they were intolerant of an ACE inhibitor, we would use an ARB. The evidence is better for an ACE inhibitor, so we would use that preferentially. And of course, while they're congested, you'd be using a diuretic to offload the fluid. And, you know, certainly adding in a, a mineral corticoid such as um, aldactone early on in the piece can certainly help uh, reduce the edema as well as, you know, not having to use uh, the, the loop diuretic as much. And then once they're stable, you would then start to add in a beta blocker. The reason we don't add a beta blocker in while they're fluid overload because it can actually make them symptomatically much worse. Now, if they're euvolemic, and you know, you may have been screening people, you know, who've had a past infarct and, you know, that they have got some subtle, you know, symptoms and signs and sure enough on an echo, they've got a, an EF that's reduced. At that point in time, because they're euvolemic, you can actually start the ACE inhibitor and a beta blocker at the same time and lower doses of each, obviously. And then you would up titrate them um, according to target therapy. And then once you've got that, you would add an MRA in, you know, like spironolactone. Both of those, you can see right down the, the left-hand side, you know, you can see here that the diuretics are only used to manage congestion or, you know, the volume overload. It has no impact on mortality in the long run. So it's purely for symptomatic relief. I mean, it's important, but if we can get symptomatic relief using, you know, substituting an MRA for some of the loop diuretics, we're actually doing a service for our patients by actually decreasing their mortality. Now, the most important step in this paradigm here is this one here. It's really up titrating the medications to the maximum tolerated doses because that's where we really start to see an impact on mortality. Um, so, you know, a, a, a very well-known uh, cardiologist, uh, Andrew Sandoni, always says, there's no such thing as a person with stable heart failure. So even if you've got someone who seems to be going pretty well on half doses of everything, yes, we should still keep up titrating the medication because they will do better. Then you can see that um, after three or six months, um, of you know, dealing with the patient, um, up titrating the medication, you actually repeat the echo. And this is really to inform us of our next steps. So, you know, you've got your person on the maximum tolerated doses, you repeat the echo. Now, if the echo is less than 40%, 
there is further things that we can do within general practice. There's this whole new class of drugs called the ARNIs um, and we can replace the ACE inhibitor or the ARB with an ARNI and you will get a even further mortality benefit. So, you know, all these things are cumulative. And so the evidence around the ARNI was on the background of people being on evidence-based therapy. So really important. Now, the other thing I, I would like to highlight is um, that with people with an ejection fraction under 35, there are a whole range of things that could be considered if they meet the criteria. And these are things like devices that you may implant, other medication like evabradine. So there's a whole, route, a whole group of things that interventions that can be done. And so at, with those people with a reduced ejection fraction, you know, less than 40, but technically less than 35, I think it's really important to have a, a, a good heart failure cardiologist that you can share the care with, because, you know, it's important that they get access to all the things that can actually make their life better and live longer. So when it comes to the pharmacological management, I'm not going to go through it, but if you look at the guidelines, you can see that the EF they've talked about here um, is 40% or less, because that's where most of the major trials were done. Um, so, um, and so that's where the strongest evidence is. You can see the um, angiotensin uh, receptor blocker, you know, it still has strong um, grade of evidence, but a moderate sort of quality of evidence because it's not as good as ACE inhibitors. So we only use ARBs if we, if we can't use an ACE inhibitor. And so, and then certainly with the ARNIs, we know that if you have someone with persistent symptoms or an EF less than 40, they will do much better on an A. So the evidence is really strong on that. So Evabridine, look, I haven't used it very much because I'm lucky enough to have access to cardiologists and heart failure specialists, but it does, you know, again, further improve outcomes. Diuretics, purely for congestion. Um, it does help with symptoms, but really does nothing for the long-term outcome of our patients. Um, and the... Um, the very last one I think is critical, and this is in people who have heart failure, who you've put on evidence-based medication, who have done really well. And we are talking now about recovered ejection fraction. So some people maybe have an ejection fraction less than 40, but once you've got them treated, they may go up to 45 or even higher. So we call that a recovered ejection fraction. The key here is not to pull back on their medications. Their medications have actually taken them to where they've got to. If you take them off, they can often relapse and then it's even harder to get them back to where they were in the first place. But you know, if there was a specific cause that was a once off, you know, um, like a postpartum heart failure, then I think um, you can talk about it. But look, I would only do that in consultation with a heart failure specialist. So the most important thing, aim for the target, the, the maximum tolerated doses. Now you heard me mention that all the studies were on, well, a lot of studies were done, you know, with a ejection fraction less than 40, but certainly in those people who had an EF from 41 to 49, they reported similar benefits. The impact wasn't as great because they're not as high a risk, but the benefits were still there. So, which is why we said anyone less, then 50% should have all these therapies. Um, unfortunately, treatment for HEF-PEF or heart failure preserved ejection fraction, um, it's still not a lot to offer really. Um, most of the treatments are really about improving symptoms and the quality of life. So it's often around fluid balance, diuretics. You know, um, Low dose spironolactone has been shown to, to decrease hospitalization. It's interesting, I use a lot of spironolactone because it's not so harsh in terms of their diuresis. And so, you know, my patients are always complaining um, about uh, the loop diuretics. But again, really it's about improving the risk factors for our patients. So hypertension, managing their diabetes. And of course, we'll talk a little bit more about 
managing diabetes and heart failure because that's actually pretty exciting. I'm not going to go through all of this, but these are the target doses. And I'd just like to highlight the, you know, aldactone, um, spironolactone, the target dose is 50. So if you can get it up there, great. Eplerinone at the moment is only initiated in hospital, but once it's initiated, we can obviously increase. Um, but again, uh, trying to get to target doses whenever possible. So uh, I did mention a little bit about um, SGL, well, about diabetes and heart failure. So I'm sure you've all been overwhelmed by the information that we've been getting about SGLT2 inhibitors. And let me say, they just seem to keep on giving. So, you know, we had our first trial showing that there was a decrease in cardiac, cardiovascular disease and a decrease in all cause mortality. Now we're seeing it's actually having great impacts on people with heart failure. And now we're seeing that in fact, it's also uh, renal sparing. So, um, you know, we've got a, a, a really good, interesting class of drugs here. So certainly we know um, that in people with type two diabetes, um, that these drugs will decrease your risk of getting heart failure, decrease hospitalization for heart failure, and will actually decrease your chance of dying. So great drug. Um, it's interesting, some of the trials now are actually giving SGLT2 inhibitors in people who don't have diabetes. And again, they're getting, they're getting great outcomes. So it, I, it's not gonna to be too long before we start seeing the SGLT2 inhibitors um, come on the market for all people with heart failure, whether they have diabetes or not. Again, really exciting. So these are all the trials. Look, I'm not gonna go through them all just in interest of time, because I think the discussion at the end uh, will be a, a great way of, of highlighting some of the, the aspects and, and the evidence. So um, just a quick summary of the, for HEFREF. Um, all patients should all have the triple therapy. They should all be on an ACE inhibitor, a beta blocker, or an MRA. ARB if you can't use an ACE inhibitor. All patients, maximum doses that you can get them to. So that's really important. It will save lives. It will stop them going to a hospital. Second tranche, you know, the use of the ARNIs, you know, in people with an ejection fraction less than 40. Multidisciplinary heart failure disease management. Now, again, I would say all patients, but you know, you can see, uh, it, and I think it's really important. And we'll talk a little bit about the, that and the nurse led medication titration. Again, um, there's some great evidence around behind that. And then the rest of it to me is around shared care uh, with a cardiologist or a person who has an interest in heart failure. I'm not going to go through the weak recommendations. And of course, your loop diuretics purely for symptomatic control. And you know, once they're uvolemic, we should be in fact reducing their diuretics you know, as tolerated. And we'll talk a little bit about flexible diuretic therapy later on. An exercise train, look, there is evidence around this and mortality. It was a great trial done um, in Italy with resistance training. Um, and uh, intravenous iron, which we'll talk about specifically later on, because that's really quite interesting. So, you know, we've got this person who's got an ejection fraction of 30, got a normal coronary angiography, so he's not ischemic, past history of hypertension, and there is medications, and he's breathless on exertion, but, you know, he's sleeping flat. So, you know, he's going to be relatively euvolemic with that, and I think that's always a really good question to ask. You know, his OBS are relatively stable. You see, I look at this and see many people would say, well, look, he's euvolemic, he's doing pretty well. I would say this is a missed opportunity, right? You know, can we bump up the bisoprolol to a higher dose, 10 milligrams? Can we swap the furosemide for aldactone? And as GPs, we're in a, a, a privileged situation where we can review people frequently and as needed. So, you know, I probably would have said, reduce or stop the furosemide and start it off with, you know, 25 milligrams of aldactone, depending on, you know, where the potassium sits, repeat the potassium within a week or two, and just to make sure it's okay. Then work out what the blood pressure is, how they're going, 
then I'd probably bump up the bisoprolol. And you can see, you know, we do this every two to three weeks or four weekly if they're maybe a bit more frail. But taking that sort of approach will make a huge difference for outcomes with our patients. So remember, no, no such thing as a stable patient. I think it's a really good call to, to arms. We do know that, you know, the multidisciplinary disease management programs do help our patients, especially around, you know, self-management, flexible diuretic therapy. This is, you know, they weigh themselves every day. If their weight's going up by more than a kilo on two days, then they take an extra dose of their Lasix and then they report to you. You know, it's about exercise, you know, salt reduction and a whole range of things. And it's really important at certainly improves their quality of life and certainly um, gets them, you know, still being active because, you know, I'm sure you've all seen patients who just wither away sometimes and we can do things that can reverse that. And a multi, you know, the, the management plan, which I've already talked about, I think is really important. But if you can't do it face to face, there is evidence um, also over the phone and video conferencing, which of course in COVID times was a great bit of information to have. Now, nurse-led titration. Now, this is really interesting. So in patients who were discharged from hospital, if they had went to a nurse-led clinic and they were up titrated, they did better than if they waited their six or eight weeks to be seen by the cardiologist because of that early up titration of the medication. And, and you know, so if, when you think about what we can do as GPs, you know, in our clinic, we actually trained our nurse to call the person in, go through, you know, their weight, their blood pressure, we'd step in and say, right, where we are, let's increase this medication and we'll see you again in two weeks. And it just works. So if you think about how to do this within your practice, it would do, you know, again, your patients will thank you. Um, and of course, um, evidence around increasing physical functioning and quality of life to do, you know, so this is where our exercise physiologists um, can certainly come in, but it really does make a big impact on quality of life. And again, self-management, education, knowledge, really, really important, and it has to be culturally um, appropriate. And again, if people know what to look out for, know when to turn up to the doctor, know when to go to hospital, it means you're catching it far earlier. And so your intervention um, has more of an impact. And there's a whole list of people who can be involved um, in the multidisciplinary team. Um, I'm not gonna, yeah. I mean, we're used to this within general practice and primary care. Um, but what I'd like to just reiterate is catching these people soon after they've been discharged. So my practice is if someone has been in hospital with a heart failure, I like to see them within 48 hours and I'll review them in two weeks. And then depending on how they go, it might be every two to four weeks after that. So we've talked about the nurse-led clinic. That's fantastic. Heart failure nurse practitioner for um, the heart. Well, we used our practice nurse. We gave education and some, you know, um, some you know uh, parameters around what she could do within the care planning process and and it's been really effective now as gps we're used to this we have we don't have patients with just one condition they've got a lot and so these are a range of comorbidities that can that are covered within the guidelines and i'm not going to go through them all but the guidelines are freely available online. And what I would suggest is if you have particular patients, you know, with heart failure and maybe atrial fibrillation, and you're not sure what's the best pathway to go, you know, there is some information there, um, what to do with, you know, hyperkalemia or hyponatremia. Um, and, you know, um, you know, avoiding, you know, cardiac, you know, things that, you know, suppress cardiac contractility, but um, we know that the reason why I wanted to get to this page is for that bottom one. Now, this is something that I do within my practice. So I do iron infusions and, but there are people with heart failure who will benefit from an iron infusion. You know, it actually improves their symptoms 
and quality of life. So not a mortality benefit, but you know, for people with heart failure, quality of life is really important. And so you can see here that if someone has a ferritin less than 100, you know, which is much higher than what we would normally expect, they should have an iron infusion. And if their ferritin's between one to 300, you know, which is getting reasonably high, but if they've got a low trans, a transferrin saturation, again, we know they'll benefit from an iron infusion. So again, thinking about your heart failure patients, again, this is people with reduced ejection fraction. You know, when you're doing your routine tests, do think of checking their ferritin from time to time. There are all the different uh, advice that people or uh, well, that you can use for the various comorbidities that you know people may um, turn up with, and so if you're particularly stuck, you know if someone's got a uh, an episode of gout, you know you can use things like colchicine or intra-articular steroids rather than obviously anti-inflammatories, because anti-inflammatory is one of the commonest reasons that will precipitate heart failure. And of course, you know towards the end we're talking about palliative care. Um, we do know that heart failure has a dreadful prognosis. Once they've been in and out of hospital a few times, it's really important to have a chat to our patients at some stage earlier rather than later about having an advanced care plan so that, you know, when they do get sick of going in and out of hospital, when the symptoms become too much, you know, they may elect not to have invasive therapy you know, and we know we do know that our palliative care teams are very good at symptom management, um, and they're now quite adept at managing patients with heart failure in the end of life. So, having a good relationship with palliative care is important. So, um, I'll just finish up on um, a little bit about COVID. I mean, you, like me, you're probably sick about hearing about COVID, but of course, just thinking about heart failure, our patients with heart failure don't do very well with COVID. I think that's, you know, fairly um, understandable. Um, you can see that it's, um, you know, up there in terms of case fatality rates. So the best thing here is prevention and isolation. Um, and certainly I do talk to my patients about, you know, strict, you know, um, quarantine sort of conditionings and as well as you know hygiene and you know um, control of contacts and so on. So um, there has been a impact on people you know with chronic disease not visiting their GPs and you know we certainly became aware of that not only with uh, people with heart failure but also with diabetes what we instituted was um, almost like a wellness check. So we had uh, my nurses that would look at the, the care plan and we would often use the care plan review as a way of re-engaging with people who you know, were isolating or too afraid to come into the clinic. And it was a great opportunity to talk about where they were at, how they were going, and you know, whether there was anything that we needed to do. And I did do a home visit on some of my patients who, you know, I've had the full PP on when I went to visit them. Um, but, you know, some of my patients uh, did need home visits and a physical assessment. So, but it was a good way of reconnecting and ensuring our patients were doing well. And so I think telehealth can be a great way of actually checking in with some of your patients very quickly make sure that they're going okay, but also in, in also in, in making sure that their care plan's being followed, that they're doing the things that they should be, um, that they're not, you know, having too much in the way of comfort food or comfort alcohol, um, very important. ACE inhibitors, look, they are safe within the, the COVID, I'm sure you've heard all of that. So we don't stop them, you know, they save too many lives to, to stop. And that's it for me. I'm, I'm sorry it was a little bit quick. It was a lot to get through, but now we'll have a bit of a discussion with Dr. Atef and, um, um, and I hope you enjoyed it. And I hope this makes you think of your heart failure population with a little bit of a, a different lens and um, hope there'll be some great outcomes. Thank you. Thank you very much to Associate Professor Ralph Autumn for presenting on the session on heart failure. And thank you very much to Dr. Atefa Sharm for facilitating the session. 
Just as we wrap up, I'd like to highlight a few resources that we have on the Heart Foundation website related to heart failure that GPs may find useful. Firstly, we have the heart failure clinical guidelines freely available. We have tools and algorithms from the guidelines, concise summary for the GP, heart failure toolkit, as well as patient resources. We also have a Heart Foundation Smart Heart app, which is freely available to download. It's available on both uh, Android and Apple operating systems, and it will give you access to the heart failure guidelines, as well as atrial fibrillation and acute coronary syndromes guidelines. And lastly, we also have information for your patients. We have the Heart Failure Toolkit, Heart Failure Video Series. We have information about our helpline, walking groups, nutrition, action plans, and we also have a directory to help you find cardiac rehab services for your patients. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that, uh, Rolf, for those uh, great presentation. Um, uh, we have uh, maybe a few, a few more minutes for uh, Q&A. So let's, let me start with uh, one of the issues we've seen uh, uh, since COVID-19, um, uh, which actually decreased hospital admission uh, for people with heart failure, uh, unfortunately, and our increased um, use of telemedicine. Uh, it would be good to hear uh, your thoughts about uh, how can we most effectively use the new ways of working of our most vulnerable uh, patients. Yeah, look, as I was saying, you know, we implemented a, a telehealth uh, wellness check with our patients with heart failure and also some of the other chronic conditions. Uh, the way we structured it, uh, we actually used our care planning. Uh, so we had a list of goals that we were trying to achieve and, and what, you know, the patients were doing and who they were supposed to be involved with. And so my nurse would give them a phone call first up, talk them through, you know, how they were going, what was going on, what were the changes, were there any particular challenges. She would then do a handover to me and I'd actually phone them back at a later stage. And so we had that two wave sort of approach. And I'm surprised at how effective that was in actually hearing how patients were going. So for me personally, it was good. Mind you, there were some patients who I had to visit. And so I elected to do a home visit in full PPE. At one stage, we had 65 cases in our local area. So people were getting quite nervous and anxious. So I think they felt reassured that if I visited them in my full gear, they felt a lot safer, but it was also an ability for me to, to do a, a physical checkup. Great. Um, so if Actually, if you have a patient who has a, a, a telephone appointment uh, with you, as you said, uh, and describes two weeks of worsening symptoms, uh, what are you, your key tips for uh, assessment uh, uh, and a potential treatment for this patient? Yeah, look, this is always a hard part about uh, telemedicine is that you can't put your hand on the patient. And so, you know, first of all, I would hope that they have a self-management plan which they've implemented. So, you know, if they do gain weight by more than a kilo for two days in a row, you know, they need to then start extra um, loop diuretic or Lasix and then they need to contact me. In this particular lady, it's two weeks. Um, so then you've got to start saying, okay, so she probably didn't have the self-management plan. And obviously, you know, sounds like she's tipping into heart failure. So we do need to find out why, what's happened, what's changed. Has she run out of medication? Is she taking her medication? Is she drinking too much alcohol? Has she gone into AF? Now, some of those things you can't check over the, 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 over the video conference. You just can't do it. Um, and so for her, it become, or for that patient, it becomes important to either get them to come in and, you know, we have a back door in our clinic. So I can say, come in the back door, straight into the room. You won't have to go into the waiting room or doing a home visit. Or if in fact, you know, they're struggling, then in fact, it may be even referring them directly to a hospital. Um, but, you know, I, I think there has to be some direct assessment of them at that point in time. I guess if that would be a safe, uh, safe step to, or safe action to have to take. I uh, agree, actually. So, uh, okay, one more thing, actually, uh, with, and that uh, we've heard about uh, SGL2 inhibitors. Uh, how can we incorporate this new, if 
confidence into, I can see you smiling. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, these are exciting drugs. I mean, yeah. um, and they will change the face of a lot of what we do. So one thing I'll implore all the GPs is get to know them and get to know them very well. So the advantage of the SGLT2 inhibitors is really they, they, they dump water and they dump water by dumping salt. And so we, we have a, a drug that's getting rid of salt and with it's taking the water. And so it's actually reducing the, the volume of fluid with it that the patient has. So it's a diuretic in one way. Um, and the way it, it does it, you know, it obviously then decreases your risk of going into heart failure later on. There are a whole lot of mechanisms which we haven't fully worked out yet, but um, it just seems to work. And so the most important thing here is that if you look at the prescriber information, it does say that the use of SGLT2 and loop diuretics is a precaution. Now, you know, the first question I get, well, you know, what does that mean? Well, I think you've got to be aware of their fluid status. So if someone's actually euvolemic and they have diabetes and they've got heart failure, you know, I want to start an SGLT2. It's just too good an opportunity to miss. So what I would then do is reduce uh, the loop diuretic by about half, and I would start a low dose of the SGLT2 inhibitor. And then I'd monitor them and get them to come back within a week, repeat the UNEs, warn them that if they get dizzy, they need to come back earlier. A lot of my patients have their own blood pressure machines, so they'll be checking it anyway because obviously if we volume deplete them and they're already hypotensive, of course we can make them too hypotensive. In people who have an adequate blood pressure, I'm not so concerned. It's only if their blood pressure is really low. So, you know, think about reducing the diuretic and then, you know, at the same time, you know, start the SGLT2 inhibitor and then titrate according to as needs. Now, of course, if they've got diabetes and they're on other drugs that can cause hypoglycemia like insulin or a sulfonylurea, you also have to think about reducing those drugs because we don't want to put them into hypos either. Yeah. So that's a safe way to start the SGL2 inhibitor in people with heart failure and diabetes. Uh, that might take us to the end of our Q&A and uh, we thank you so much for your great presentation. Uh, and I think we can hand over to Brooke. Thank you. Thank you.